but anyway, welcome to your makeup lecture. So this is our makeup lecture. Hopefully this will be online too. Um, I just said this, I'm recording using software local to my computer now. Um, just a couple announcements that I've already made. So lab number two, in case you didn't know this already, is not due this week, it's due, uh, or not due next week, but due the week after spring break. So you have several more weeks uh, to get that done. You know you have a midterm next week on Thursday, March 17th. That's gonna be in our regular room, 213 Wheeler. It says this room, but it's not this room, it's our regular room. Um, and you're gonna have a review session for the midterm, uh, which will be uh, Monday uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. I have a question mark there, but that is going to be in this room, uh, the Hogan room, I now know. So I think I'm gonna add that to this right now. In 521, Corey, which is right here. Okay, so those are the announcements that I have. Any questions about anything logistically? All right, one more thing is we're going to end up here about 4.30, and uh, that's when those in Travis's discussion session, well, those in the Friday discussion session, which is usually at 4 o'clock, just go down to that room, and Travis will start at 4.30, okay, if you want to do the discussion, okay? And you have your homework assignment uh, homework number seven, I'll tell you, you will not get another homework assignment on Tuesday next week because you have the exam, so you get a break, you get a long break because, you know, then you have spring break, so no homework for two weeks or so. And then after spring break, the, uh, the lab number three will start, which is a much more intense lab than the labs that you've had so far, and at that point, we'll also be lighter on you on the homework as well. Okay, so the days of intense lots of homework are nearing the end. Uh, but this one due Tuesday is uh, has a you know it's a, it's a nice little homework to make sure you uh, you get your fill of that kind of stuff before it starts dying down. Um, okay, so today what we'll be doing is talk continuing our, our discussion of finite gain bandwidth product, and then we'll start talking about high gain op amps. So we've looked at op amps already, single stage op amps, but what we want to do is look at how we can get even higher gain than what we've gotten so far in our simple op-amp stages. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna cascode devices. Have you seen before, cascoding can increase your gain uh, in a big way. Uh, the other way to do it is cascaded devices. So it's one multi-stage type amplifiers where the first stage is a differential pair to make it like an op-amp. So we're still talking op-amps, but op-amps of course are amplifiers and we use the same tricks that we've been using to make single stage op-amps but now to make differential input, single-ended output type op-amps here. Um, all right, and so last time we were looking at these non-ideal op-amps, so let's go forward here. We looked at this, all right? So if you'll recall, we looked at the fact that in an ideal op-amp, your gain's infinity, your frequency range is also infinite, uh, but in reality, your gain is given by this sort of equation here, this transfer function, where you have a finite gain, a naught, you have a finite frequency omega b, and your Bode plot looks something like this, which I think you've seen many times in previous courses. Um, we have a 20 dB per decade roll off here after you pass your 3 dB frequency. And we talked about this at length last time. We, we put down some equations, determined some magnitudes, uh, determined that you can define a unity gain frequency that's equal to your low frequency gain A naught times your bandwidth. And as we'll see later on, that's gonna be a very important number because as you put this in the feedback, this gain bandwidth product that I'm calling it always stays the same, okay? And so it becomes an easy way to figure out what the bandwidth is if you now know your new gain after you put this in feedback, but I'll show that to you in more detail and a couple other things that you may remember there, but I won't point out now. Um, so last time we were looking at this example of a non-inverting amplifier, but using this uh, non-ideal op-amp. So it has a finite gain, finite bandwidth. And so the main difference with what we've done before is that we can't quite use our ideal op-amp rules anymore because this is non-ideal. 
And so one of the ideal op-amp rules that we had from before is that the plus and minus terminals are exactly the same voltage. That's one we can no longer say because our gain is finite now. And so instead of saying that the plus and minus terminals are equal, we now have to let them take on whatever values they need to. And last time, we just labeled those things uh, V plus and V minus, okay? And then we took into account how they were related to one, each other, one another by saying that the output voltage was equal to this A of S, which again is this transfer function, times V plus minus V minus. So that's our new model for this op-amp. Okay, and so then we, we go about this and, and without saying that V plus equals V minus, we define a node one here and we then just do Kirchhoff's current law and nodal analysis to solve for the equations that we want in this circuit. And in particular, we want the gain of this thing. So we want V naught divided by VI as a function of S, which is this frequency variable right here, a complex variable. Um, and so this is the math involved with doing that analysis and, and doing that analysis, which I'm calling a brute force derivation, uh, we end up with this expression here, where the gain is the one plus R2 over R1 that you expect. Um, I guess what I'm doing is assuming that the gain A naught is finite but large. Okay, so I'm assuming, let me put this here. Assuming that A naught is finite but large, so I'm still making an approximation there, and sometimes I can't even make that approximation. That's why I want to state this here. If, if the gain A naught is as small as, say, 10, then you don't want to make this approximation. You actually want to stick in even A naught in this equation. You want to bring A naught past this right here and just do all the math for this. But I'm not gonna do it for this one because I'm gonna do it for the next method for deriving this, okay? So this was the answer for this. You had this gain, and that was a DC gain. That's a low frequency gain. And then multiplied by a frequency shaping term now, where you recognize it as one over one plus S over some value here. That's just like this one plus S over omega B except instead of omega b, you now have omega b times r1 over r1 plus r2, okay? And so your frequency has changed now for this thing. All right, so that was one way to try to derive the transfer function for this new op-amp circuit. But here's another way to interpret this. I'm doing the exact same problem here but I'm trying to do it in a more insightful way. And the more insightful way I claim is that if you could take this op-amp, this op-amp circuit, and you can reduce it to being equivalent to this block diagram-like feedback circuit, then you can solve this problem by just sheer recognition. The same way that we solve a lot of our circuits problem, right? You're doing circuits now by inspection analysis. And so what I'm trying to show you right now is sort of an inspection analysis method for doing op-amp feedback circuits. Okay, and the inspection analysis is you already know this block diagram for feedback. You've seen it in this class. You've probably seen it in many other classes before. And you know that when you solve this block diagram, you have a certain transfer function that you end up with for this. Okay, and so if you can equate different parts of this circuit here to different parts in this block diagram, then you can just jot down what this gain equation should be for this op-amp, okay? And so what's equivalent to what? We went through that last time. So this has an input voltage. It's got an output voltage. It feeds back the output voltage through this beta parameter here. And that then goes to subtract from the input voltage to create this error voltage right here. And this error voltage, if we look at this circuit here, where is it, right? Well, we, we obviously know where V sub I is and we know where V, v naught is here, okay? We sort of know where that feedback voltage is because we can look across this resistor R1 here. So the total input voltage goes from this node down to ground, okay, which is what, I'm, uh, what I've written right here from last time. The error voltage, 
is kind of that voltage that's going between the plus and minus terminals, right? That's the differential voltage going into the op amp. And often that's what op amps are used for. They're used to amplify an error voltage in a feedback circuit. Okay, so there's your error voltage, meaning that this must be your feedback voltage, V sub B. And so now I've identified all of these parameters, V sub I, V naught, V sub B, and V sub B. And so with that, I can obviously see where the amplifier is here. That's the op amp. Okay, and then I can see what this beta is right here. That beta is derived from this R1, R2 network. Right, that's the feedback network. And so beta is just our feedback network for all of this. All right, so let's go to the next page on this. And this is sort of where we end it off, right? If this is the feedback network, then I can just sort of redraw this and say this is going from V naught to V beta. And the transfer function from V naught to V beta is merely uh, this voltage divider function, right? It ends up being R1 divided by R1 plus R2. Okay, so hopefully you can all see this, you can all recognize that feedback thing. Now, one thing that we know, say, say if I stay down here, we know what the transfer function of this is, right? Because we've derived this before. We know that this is V naught over VI is a function of S. That's going to be equal to this gain, A of S, divided by 1 plus beta times A of S. Right, that's basically what you've seen before in any course that you've had in controls. I'm sure in a previous course you've seen that. If not, we did this already before in this class too. Okay, so we're going to use that. So we're going to recall from our previous feedback analysis. That again that equation, V naught over V I of S is equal to A of S over 1 plus beta times A of S. I don't know why I stuck that in there, but I'll fix it. Okay, and I know something about A of S as well, right? So we know A of S is that non-ideal op amp transfer function. So it's equal to an A naught, which is our finite gain, divided by 1 plus S over omega B, okay? And so that's information that I know that I want to combine with this here to then be able to write out my total transfer function sort of by inspection now as V naught over V sub I of S is now equal to, and I'm just going to plug in these values, A naught over 1 plus S over omega B divided by 1 plus beta times this A naught over 1 plus S over omega B, okay? That now becomes my solution to this problem, which you can see I'm just writing down pretty much by inspection now, because I've, ident I've identified my beta, and I know that my transfer function is A naught over 1 plus S over omega B. Now all I have to do is plug in what beta really is here, okay? But before doing that, let's expand this into something a little easier to look at. And so V naught over VI as a function of S, I can pull out some pieces of this. So first of all, I want to pull out a DC term from this. And so I can pull out the A naught from this and a one plus beta times A naught. And then all of this becomes one over one plus S over omega B times 1 plus beta times A naught. Okay, so I'm basically just reducing that thing, doing a little bit of factoring there, and that then becomes what you would usually write down as a solution to this before you plug in the value of beta here. Okay, but I want to just look at this right now because I just want to point out a couple things about this that you'll be able to notice. And you'll always see things, something like this. You'll always be able to, to write an expression like this, where this first term in that expression, you can call your closed loop DC gain factor. OK? 
Okay, so that's your low frequency or DC gain term. Okay, or your mid-band gain term. Okay, in this case it's DC. But if I had some bypass capacitor somewhere here, then I would have, you know, that roll-off that you dealt with earlier in the course for low frequencies. But in this case, I don't have bypass capacitor, so this is the DC gain term. Okay, this term right here that has the S in it, right, the S is a complex variable. You know that S uh, is basically J omega in this case, okay, but it can be much more, right? It could be A plus J omega as well if you really had a different situation. But for us, it's basically J omega. And this is now our frequency shaping term. This is what shapes the frequency response of this. All right, so there's, there's even more things we can look at here. We defined a couple parameters in the last lecture, and so I'm going to point them out because they're important parameters, but one of them is this beta times A naught. This we gave another symbol, one symbol that's used in gray and Meyer, T naught. Okay, so I'll just say T naught is equal to beta times A naught, uh, which is defined as our loop gain. Okay, that's a loop gain, but I need to specify the frequency of this loop gain. So this is the loop gain at omega equals zero. Okay, so in other words, at DC. Okay, so this is sort of by inspection I've written down this equation here. Right, I'm not finished yet because the real part of the inspection was I figured out what beta was. Okay, so I figured out what beta was. So now all I have to do is plug in beta. And so let's go back and do that. Just plug in beta, and if I do that, then I can write that V naught over VI of S is going to be about equal to, and in this case, I'm going to make an assumption that A naught is large. Okay, so I'm going to make the same assumption that I made above. So A naught is large. It's not infinite. It's finite, but it's large. Okay, and if I can do that, then I can say this is equal to 1 over beta. Okay, and then I still have this term that comes after here, 1 plus S over omega B times 1 plus beta A naught. But I can even take this, this term right here, this 1 plus beta A naught. If beta times A naught is large, which it usually is, then I can just call this omega B uh, times beta times A naught. For beta times A naught much larger than 1. Okay? And so if I do this, now all I have to do is plug in my value for beta here. And so from this analysis at the top of this page now, that's my beta. Beta is equal to R1 over R1 plus R2. And so this DC term that I have here I'm saying is 1 over beta. And so that ends up being 1 plus R2 over R1. Okay, And then this second term ends up being, when I plug in my beta, 1 over 1 plus S over omega B times A naught times this same R1 over R1 plus R2. And I can now compare this. This is the solution that I get through this sort of inspection analysis that I've done. And I can now compare this to the previous brute force derivation and you can see that I have exactly the same equations there. Okay? So just two ways to solve this problem, two ways to look at it. It doesn't matter which way you do it. Right? If, you, if you're comfortable doing the brute force, then do the brute force. You have to apply KCL. You have to do nodal analysis to do it. That might be a pain for some people, but some people may enjoy it. Or you can do it... <laughs> Or you can do it using the uh, uh, inspection analysis where you just recognize the feedback circuit. You recognize where the beta is. You recognize where the error voltage is. You recognize different things. Okay? But the main thing that I really wanted to point out is derive these e expressions here. So you can see a couple things. 
let me make this look a little clearer here at least. That should be a, a B. Omega B. I guess that's a little clearer. Um, but the main thing to look at here is that because of the feedback, you've affected your gain. But you've also affected your uh, frequency response. Okay? And so I think just to finish this up, just to be complete on this too, I've made this approximation here where A naught is large. Okay? But I want to make sure that I mention something like, you know, what if. What if A naught is not large? So it's not equal to large. Okay? If that's the case, then I can't say what I said before. I can't say that A naught over 1 plus beta A naught is equal to 1 over beta. Okay? I would have to include A naught in all of my equations. And so, I need to include A naught in the gain term, in the DC gain term. Of the previous analysis. Okay? Yes. See, I would want A naught to be 100 or something like that, right? If it's 100, that's a pretty good value. I, of course, I would like it to be 1,000 or 10,000. And in most op amps, you try to make it you know, like, like the 741 op amp that you, you can buy off the shelf or so. That has a lot of gain, 50,000 or something like that. Okay, but then some op amps that are on chip, like in MOS circuits, where you have more control of what you're going to hook up, hook, hook it into, 100 is okay. Uh, so it, it depends on what you want, but you always know you want it to be much greater than one. Okay? Um, and so with this, let me make a few observations here. And these observations I'm going to cheat with and just grab, as you're now used to me doing every once in a while. Hopefully not too much. But, you know, you want me to grab this, otherwise the sleep factor is just too much, right? You don't want me writing all that stuff. Okay, so here's some observations here, right? One is that the closed loop gain, I, I can write the closed loop gain in many different ways here. Let me get back to this. Okay, so I, the closed loop gain is equal to A naught over 1 plus beta times A naught, right? Which is A naught over 1 plus T naught, where T naught is equal to the loop gain. And if T naught is much greater than 1, which it usually is, then I can write this closed loop DC gain as A naught divided by T naught. Okay? And so what does this mean on the graph that I have to the left here? Okay, that means the closed loop gain is reduced from the open loop gain by 1 plus T naught. All right? And so if I'm given this graph here, and I'm told that that graph represents the transfer function of the op amp itself. Okay, how would I go about drawing on this the transfer function of the closed loop circuit? Okay, so the closed loop circuit being this circuit that we just analyzed. Okay, so I have this circuit with this R2 and R1 there. You know, is there an easy way for me to just draw on this same plot what the closed loop gain function looks like, and it turns out there is. And there is because of what I just wrote right here. The gain is simply, or, or the DC gain, the low frequency gain is simply the original DC gain of the op amp, which is A naught, divided by the loop gain T naught. Okay, so that's where the loop gain becomes very important. Right, that beta times A naught, or any other way that you try to calculate that loop gain, that's important because if you know beta times A naught or T naught, which are the same things, right? If you know T naught, then you can immediately draw the transfer function for the closed loop op amp circuit. Okay, so if I know T naught, then I just go down 20 log of 1 plus T naught, okay? 
where, where if one if t naught is much greater than one, I could ignore the one there. But I'll just write it as one plus t naught being this equation right here. Okay, I just go there. If that's the point where where that is right here, then to draw the transfer function for this new closed loop feedback circuit, I'm just going to go straight across here, and then follow straight down this 20 dB per decade. Very simple. So this now becomes the new transfer function for my closed loop circuit. See how simple that is? I just get the uh, loop gain, T naught, equals beta times A naught. I just come down 20 log of that loop gain, and that's my new transfer function right there. It goes all the way across, and then it's 3 dB frequency you're noticing. What am I doing if I put that down here? It looks like that 3 dB frequency is now omega B times 1 plus T naught, right, which is the same as omega B times 1 plus beta times A naught. And so the question is that, right? Well, let's go back and take a look at our derivation. Absolutely, that's right. Okay? So the two things that happen whenever you apply feedback is you'll lower your gain to a gain that's smaller than the original gain of the op amp, but that's now decided by these resistors R1 and R2. And you like that because usually these resistors R1 and R2, you have a lot of control over their values. Okay, so if you set your gain with R1 and R2, you have a lot of control over your gain. Whereas with the op amp, you had a huge gain, but you didn't have control over it. It may be 50,000, it may be 40,000, it may be 60,000. Right, so by using feedback, we give ourselves a much more controllable gain. It's a smaller gain, but in general, you don't need a gain of 50,000 for uh, an actual circuit, right? You're going to need a gain of 10 or 20 or something like that, right? Whatever R2 over R1 is in this case. Um, but not only that, if you lower your gain by a certain amount, you're going to increase your frequency by exactly that same amount, okay? And so getting back to this, pretty much what I'm saying is that the 3 dB frequency, so I'm skipping to point number 3 here, the 3 dB frequency has increased from omega B to omega B times 1 plus the loop gain. And what does that mean? That means that my gain bandwidth product for the closed loop circuit, right, if my gain is equal to A naught over 1 plus beta times A naught, right, which is what we found it had to be equal to in the closed loop circuit, and my frequency is now omega B times 1 plus beta times A naught, now my gain bandwidth product is still A naught times omega B, right? It's still omega T, which is our unity gain frequency, and that's why omega T is such an interesting parameter to quote for any op amp. Because if I give you omega B or omega T, that gives you the unity gain frequency, which is also equal to the gain bandwidth product that you will always have when you hook this in feedback, or even if it's not in feedback, right? The open loop has that gain bandwidth product, and you hook the op amp in the feedback, it'll also have that gain bandwidth product, okay? So the gain bandwidth product stays the same no matter what feedback you put across this thing. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about that? Okay. Um, I should say one more thing here. I've described the closed loop gain as being equal to A naught divided by T naught. And to me, that's the easiest way to determine what the new gain is. Okay, to just, just look at the old gain and go down from that 20 log 1 plus T naught. But that's not the only way to do it, right? The gain is also equal to, you know, if, if so it's equal to that, but if I if beta times A naught is much greater than 1, it's A naught divided by beta. The A naught's cancel. It's 1 over beta, right? So I could also do this, just go up from 0 dB by 20 log 1 over beta. Okay, so in this way, I just determine beta, that feedback factor, and I have the gain right there by just, just taking 20 log of that and going up from 0 dB from there. Okay? 
All right, so that's sort of feedback circuits that I wanted to talk about. This is going to become more important later on in the class because most of the rest of this class, after we're finished with op amps, is how to do feedback circuits like this while keeping the op amp stable. Okay, so we talked a little bit about negative feedback and positive feedback. And we talked about if you have negative feedback, it's stable. If you have positive feedback, it's unstable. The problem becomes you're trying to do negative feedback, but you can't really achieve negative feedback. Something goes wrong. And what goes wrong is that your op amp does not have zero phase shift. It does not necessarily have a 180 degree phase shift when you want it. There's always some phase shifts that are on top of that. And if you get enough of those parasitic phase shifts, you can suddenly make that phase shift go from some stable phase shift, like 180 degrees, suddenly to 360 degrees, in which case you now have a positive feedback. You go from negative feedback that you intended to have, but suddenly you have positive feedback. Okay, if you don't understand what I just said, don't worry. We're going to spend the rest of the semester pretty much talking about that. Okay, but before doing that, let's hit another topic here. And the topic I want to talk about now is high gain op amps. Okay, so we've now talked about MOS op amps that have gains on the order of, say, 100 or so. I mean, in your homeworks, that's sort of what you end up having, right? But a lot of times, you want even more gain than that, right? You'd like to have 1,000 or something like that, even on chip. And so the question is, how do you get more of that gain from an MOS op amp type design? And let's talk about that now. So um, let's talk about higher gain op amps. And that question is basically, how can we increase gain? Well, it turns out there's two ways to try to do this from what we've done before. So what we've done before is we have that uh, uh, the differential pairs, right? Use a single MOS device and maybe some kind of active or uh, current mirror load. You can even have resistive load or so. But those don't give you a whole heck of a lot of gain, right? You're not going to get a gain of 1,000 or 10,000 out of something like that, right? Um, and so there are a couple ways to increase gain. One of them you already know because we've played around with this in single-ended circuits. And one of those is to use a cascode type configuration, okay? The second way to do it is to have a cascade of amplifiers. So now your op amp is not just that first differential stage, but it's followed by another stage that can give you even more gain. Okay, so part of what I want to do is figure out what's the most sensible approach for most applications. What do you want to do? Do you want to do it all in a single stage, which sounds good, right? It sounds like there's fewer transistors or so. Or do you want to do it in two stages, which may take more transistors, may take more power consumption or so. Uh, and so why would you want to do that? We, we need to look at what the benefits are. What are the pros and cons of these two types of higher gain op amps? And so let's first take a look. Let's do them one at a time. Let's take a look at the cascode type thing. And the cascode type thing is really what people will call a telescopic op amp. So anytime you hear the word telescopic, they're really talking about uh, an op amp that's using cascoded. Um, and in this case, we'll talk about one with a single-ended output first. So telescopic op amp with single-ended output. Um, I, it, it only has to do with because in a telescope, you've got several stages, right? You can do this. This is just to several stages going straight up, is what it is. Ra rather than splitting it into separate ones, you have all, all stages together. Um, I'm going to cheat on you again, because I, I certainly don't want to keep drawing this thing. <laughs> um, OK, copy and paste. All right, so this is your telescopic op amp here. And yeah, it looks complicated, but 
it's not that complicated from what you've already learned. Right, so you can see a lot of the stuff you already know about these things. So first of all, um, you've got a diff pair. You've got your M1 and your M2. And you know, that's nothing big to you. You've seen that already. Easy stuff, right? Maybe not. We'll, we'll, we'll see just, just how easy it ends up being. Okay, but you've got these two devices there, right? And you can see they're loaded by a second device. That's the cascode. Right? So you know that's a cast code there. And then you see, at least on this, in, in this output area here, you got a cast code of other transistors here. And so you actually have a current mirror here, a cast coded current mirror, something that you've seen already as well. Right? So this is just combining things that you've already seen, except now making them differential and biasing this thing up again with a current source. And oftentimes you're going to want this current source to be a cascode type current source as well. Okay? And so let's take a look at this. And so as the ad, what I've advertised is that this is going to be a lot more gain than we had before. Okay, so let's verify that that's the truth here. Uh, but before doing that, let's just take a look at how this thing might operate. All right, so if you look at this, this is going to be a certain amount of impedance that you're going to see right here. All right, this is a certain amount of impedance as well. This is a much lower impedance. Okay, so let's start playing around with this and determine what the impedances look like. So this impedance here, looking in this way, uh, let's go for another color. Sorry, let me... What's that impedance looking that way? That's what I've been calling R0 here. Okay, well, you know how to get that. So what you're going to do is you're going to drive this thing with some test voltage source. You're going to measure the test current, Ix, and this R0 is then going to be Vx over that Ix. Okay, but we know how to do these problems already by inspection. We know that if we look up this way, by inspection, we, you can tell me what that resistance is, right? So go ahead, let me know. Excellent. So you're telling me this right now, which is right. Absolutely correct. Okay, that's great. And so I'm going to just say that that GM6 times R08 is very large. So I'm just going to say this is equal to GM6 times R06 times R08. Right? It's like a GM times an R0 squared is what this is. That's a pretty big number, right? So let's just do this. So it's equal to GM times an R0 squared. That is a big number, right? A much bigger resistance than we've got before in, our, in any differential circuit. And that's great because, remember, resistance is part of that gain equation. Okay? What resistance do I see looking down this way? RO4, 1 plus GM4 times, yeah, RO2, but really? Is it a half circuit? Yeah. Well, look at the circuit. Does it look symmetrical? Well, what about these guys here versus those guys? Right? So they're not really symmetrical. This is not because it's the anything with a current mirror load is not symmetrical. It's got to have a resistor on this side, or at least these can't be diode connected. Right? So this actually is not symmetrical. We cannot do the, the half circuit thing on this. It turns out that if you try doing that, you end up with the right answer anyway. <laughs> but this is one of those things where you know, you're, you're going to have the current run around this thing and be mirrored back. This has a negative feedback that we saw before for the current mirror load. Okay, so looking down this way, this is 1 plus GM4 times 2 times R02, okay, which is about equal to 2 times GM4 times an R02 an R times the R04. And as before, what's going to happen is this current 
that's driven into this is going to go down this way and come right back up that way. Okay, so that current will, will just turn around, right, because it's got nowhere to go on this. These are MOS devices. It has to go through the channel of these devices here. And it sees what it thinks is a low impedance looking into the source of this transistor. It again sees a low impedance looking into the source of that transistor. It doesn't go, of course, from the source to the drain, but it just keeps going up this way. It sees this diode connection, which to it is another low impedance, so it just keeps going up. Another diode connection, another load impedance, continue going up. Okay, so that's like the reference current going into a current mirror, which is now then mirrored in the upward direction to the other side. Okay, and this other side current comes out here with the same value uh, equal to Vx over 2 GM4 R0 2 R0 4. Okay, whereas this current right here was also that same value, Vx divided by 2 GM4 R0 2 R0 4. Okay, and so again, I'm going to add those currents together. And so the total output resistance that I end up with, as before, ends up being uh, two of these things. So GM6 times R0 6 R0 8. Uh, in parallel with what I see in the downward direction, which becomes two of these things, one over two of these Vx things, so that becomes GM4 times R0 2 R0 4. I guess I should do write it like this. Okay, so that's what my R0 ends up being. Okay, which is much bigger than what we've seen before because we're now looking at effectively a GM of an n-type NMOS device times the R0 of my NMOS device squared parallel with the GM of my P-type device times the R0 of my P-type device squared. Did you have a question? Yeah. The 2R0 2. So that's coming because you're actually loading. So, so when you look down here, what do you see? Right, so, so, yeah, so you see R0, 2, but you have this, right, which is a 1 over GM, and so you have that R0, 2 times 1 plus a GM times that 1 over GM equals a 2 R0, 2. Okay, yes. M6 to M5. Uh, what do you so so which is mirroring to where? So so no. See, there's only one mirror here. M5, M7 mirrors to M6, M8. But really, what's happening is M7 is mirroring to M8. Right, so this current goes through, it gets through M7, it determines what the VGS of M7 is, changes the VGS of M7, which changes the VGS of M8 exactly the same way. Right, and so when those VGSs are changing exactly the same way, that's why you're mirroring the current. M8 mirrors to M7, no, because M7 is in control, right? Oh, I see. You're, you're, you're thinking that you can go backwards. That if you have this current here, right, then that should mirror back to M7. But no, that's not the case because M7 is a diode now. Right? There's a couple things happening here, right? The other reason why is, is think, of, think of these nodes right here, right? Why is that current? So why is the current flowing into M8 and M6? Right? It's, it's flowing to these because you have a very large voltage happening here. Right? So this is a high impedance node. Right? And so there's going to be a lot of gain from your input to your output. So if I had to draw the signal at your output, maybe it looks like this. Right? Very large signal. But if I had to draw the signal at this node, 
What's it going to look like? Yeah. Tiny little thing, right? So if you think of this, this voltage across here does create a lot of current going through that, right, through the R0, but this is too small a voltage to create anything coming up here. Okay, so the diode connection out of these things here, I'm leaning on this and it's moving forward. The, the diode connection uh, that's out here makes out a very small signal here, right? So you get very little movement of anything there, right? So you can't go backwards on that, right? This can drive current into that, but that can't really drive current into that because of those impedance differences and the consequent signal size differences on across both of them. Okay? Yes? Can you get rid of the factor of two? Which factor of two? This one? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So what's happening is I'm calculating the total current that's going in. So I'm saying that Ix, this Ix here, is going to be equal to two pieces of current. There's a current going up here, which is going to be Vx over this resistance up here, which is the RO6, uh, well, which one do I want to write? Let's, let's write the simpler one. Let's write this GM6 times RO6, RO8. Okay, but then it's got another current component coming down this way, which is the Vx over 2GM4, RO2, RO4. But because this current got mirrored to the other side, the other side, I've got another current component going up, which is still in the same direction as Ix. So I add another Vx times 2, or divided by 2GM4, RO2, RO4. And these two are the same here. So these two add to eliminate that too. And so this then goes to that once I solve for Vx over Ix. You see that? Or do you want me to write more of this out? I'll write more of it out. That's OK. Let me write a little bit more of it here. Okay, so, so what happens is this term goes to, so that becomes Ix times Vx over uh, Gm6, Ro6, Ro8 plus Vx divided by, so, so this becomes 2Vx, right, because these are the same denominator. So 2Vx over 2Gm4, R0, 2, R0, 4, these twos cancel. Okay, so you see that. Okay, yeah. So that's what's happening. You mirror it back, and it looks like all that, that current is there. Um, why do I keep doing this, right? Because you could get away by saying it's a half circuit, mainly because it's not a half circuit, and there are actually some versions of this, like what's on the midterm e exam. If you look at your midterm uh, from the previous year, that was a tricky problem, right? I purposely made a problem such that, you know, if you thought that uh, you could use a half circuit, you'd be wrong. Okay, you have to uh, uh, you have to look at it this way to get that one right. Okay, so it's important to understand this here. Okay, um, yeah, it's mean, but you know. Um, okay, so let's. What am I doing here? Let's continue with this. Now I want the full gain. I want the full gain of this thing, okay? And so to get the full gain, I'm going to want to do a couple more things. Uh, right? I w I'm going to want to know what the GM is for this. What's the effect of GM? Because the gain is going to be whatever the capital GM of this is times that output resistance, right? Whatever current I'm sending to this output times that resistance is the gain. So the question is how much current am I sending to that output uh, for a given input signal? And by now, you can easily do this, right? This is now no different than what we've done with the previous emitter or source-coupled pair circuits. I mean, there may be a lot of other transistors here, but nothing changes in this respect, okay? And nothing changes because I still have across here plus minus V in over 2, right? And I still have across here uh, plus minus the rest of that V in over 2, right? 
And so what does that mean? That means I am generating here a current that is equal to GM times VN over 2. Okay. And right here I'm also generating a current that's going up in this direction now, which is GM times VN over 2. Okay. So I've got half of GM pretty much pushing this current through the output there. But on this side, since I'm pushing that current there, that's getting mirrored to that side. It's always getting mirrored like that. So I'm effectively sticking this GM, GM times VN over 2 over here. So the total current that's coming out of this thing, the I0 current, is going to be GM times VN. And since capital GM equals, sorry, I0 over VN, capital GM is just little gm. Okay? Any questions about that? And you notice what I did? I, I'm ignoring the effect of any of these transistors here because if this transistor that has the actual input voltage across it is driving the current here, and it is M1 that drives the current and M2 that drives the current, if those are the two driving the current, then that current's just going to go straight through this transistor. This is like a pass gate transistor. It's, it's a common gate transistor, right, where you can think of this VB as being AC ground. If that's AC ground, the current is going to go straight through that transistor. It just goes straight through these transistors and gets mirrored to the other side. Same thing here. So these cascode devices, they do nothing for you, right? These devices, your input devices, M1 and M2, are doing everything for you. All the cascode devices are doing is raising your impedance. But in terms of the currents generated at the input of this circuit, it's all M1 and M2. Right? That's why I was criticizing some of that CNT work uh, before, right? Because they, they, they stuck the CNT transistors right here. And they still had a real transistor doing this. And so what? Right? No wonder it performed well, because it's the real transistor doing all the work. You had, you had a question. Yeah, I'm assuming that I have a completely differential voltage on this. But, you know, I could, do th I, I could always do that, though, because both sides are symmetric, right? Because in the end, this thing down here, right, it really looks like this. If I draw it as a T model, right, it really looks something like this, where I'm putting V in there. Well, I'm putting V in across those two. Right? So it's really like that. And so in a small signal sense, it is absolutely symmetrical. Right? Because this is just a 1 over GM here. That's a 1 over GM. Two equal resistors, you will always drop half of that VN here and half of that VN there. Okay? So you have to look at it in a small signal sense. I think that was confusing to some people in that lecture that I did a while ago, where I put a 1 volt here and a minus 1 volt here, and I said that's always going to be 0. It, it won't be in the large signal DC case, but it will be in the small signal case, which looks like this, right, when you use the T model. Okay? All right, so I pretty much got all the different pieces that I need to get gain out of this. And so the gain of this thing, I have my GM, I have my R0, the gain of this thing which I'll write as usual A sub V. That's just going to be the GM of an n-type device. I'll write it this way. The GM of an n-type device, so either M1 or M2, right, uh, times this quantity here, which is all the resistors. So that's the GM of an n-type device times the R0 of an n-type device squared, parallel with the GM of a p-type device times the R0 of a p-type device squared. And that's it. Okay, so that's my gain. And what can I say about this gain? I can say this is a huge resistance. 
right? I can also say this is a huge resistance. It's larger than the previous resistance we had by a full R naught. Well, no, no, not by a full, by a GM R naught, right? And a GM R naught equals what? Could be 100, right? So if our previous gain was 100 in the non-cascode type op amp, we now have 100 times 100, right? Which is 10,000. So we've gone from 100 to 10,000 just by creating this telescopic op amp that has these cascodes where the only difference now is the cascodes are giving us a much higher impedance, much higher resistance at the output, but the drive going on the GM is still the same. Okay, the voltage to current is still the same, it's just the impedance is much higher now. The current goes into that impedance, so the effective output voltage becomes much larger. I'm still doing this. <laughs> okay, so bottom line here, Is that the gain will be big? Yes. Uh, oh, th this is just the same as this equation right here. See that? These are the same. That and that are the same. Okay. Yes. Oh, because really large resistors take too much space. So to lay out a really large resistor, uh, see this is, these add, you know, many hundreds of kilo ohms of resistance basically to that. Well, adds a hundred times more resistance to that. To get a resistance on that level, like a mega ohm, would take the space of maybe a thousand transistors. It's yeah, it's all cost, yeah. So in MOS design, avoid resistors at all costs because they'll cost you a lot of money. In bipolar design, off-chip design, you can use resistors, but if you're doing MOS, if you have a resistor on your chip and your competitor does not, you lose, right? Your competitor is gonna sell cheaper than you and you will lose, right? Because no one wants to buy your expensive part. Okay, so that's the reason. Um, okay, so let's stay with this circuit here. Let's keep playing around with it. And this time, let's go for another parameter that we're usually interested in, and that is uh, the frequency response. Okay, so for frequency response, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, no, it's kind of obvious for this one, right? This one's kind of obvious, right? What, what determines the dominant pole? If, you, if you're looking at a circuit and you want to figure out what node determines the dominant pole, what would you go after first? The largest, yeah. largest impedance, yeah. You're looking for the largest impedance. Where's the largest impedance? Okay. Yeah, exactly, right there at the output. Okay, and so in a lot of MOS circuits, it's all this capacitance right here which I'll call CL, uh, where I'm going to say CL is all capacitors. So all capacitance at this node, uh, including from the next stage. Okay. So that's where this particular design may have a little bit of a disadvantage because its frequency response is going to be very susceptible to how much capacitance is the next stage, right? So what could the next stage look like, right? The next stage could be another MOS stage like this, right? Which means you got a certain amount of CGS capacitance looking that way, a certain amount of CGD capacitance looking that way, and that could be significant to changing the frequency response of this circuit here. So if you're going to use this type of circuit, you better know what your next stage is, and usually you do. Okay, so you use this type of circuit when all of your circuit is on chip. So you're in control of what that next stage is, right? But if this were an op amp that you use off chip, something you can buy a, a, as as a, a little IC, you're not going to want to have an output stage like this. There's too much variation in what that output capacitance can be. But if it is like this and you're using this output capacitance, you're right. 
that's a huge resistance and you combine that huge resistance here to get the dominant pole. So that node contributes the dominant pole and you can immediately write that dominant pole frequency as 1 over R0 times CL. Okay, very quickly we get the frequency response of this thing. Now, yeah, sure, there's nodes here, there's capacitance there, there's resistance there, they're going to contribute some time constants too, but they're so small compared to this because the R0 is so enormous that it just doesn't matter these other nodes. Okay, for the dominant pole, but as you'll see later on when we talk about stability, we're not going to be satisfied with just determining the dominant pole. We're going to have to determine the second most dominant pole too. And for the second most dominant pole, we're going to have to be worried about what's going on out here. Okay, but let's not worry about that just yet. Let's just be satisfied with our dominant pole right now. That's all I'll ask you for on the exam, for example. Right, on the final, I'll ask you for all the different poles. And you'll be able to do it by then. But we don't have, yeah, we don't have the skills to do that just yet. Okay, now, yes. Uh, you, you mean because there's two inputs here? Uh, no, because of that input being there, there's two ways to get to the output. One is to get from the bottom, one is to get from the top. No, but the, they're, they're simultaneous, right? It's all happening simultaneously. Like yeah, that's, that's true. No, they don't end up being close to each other because the, o the other pole, you, you're right. So, so you have to look at those two different paths to get all the poles. But this other path here is going through these very low impedance nodes here. So if you, right, this is high impedance right here, the path coming out there. But this path here is going through low impedance nodes to go out there. Right, so this node right here is very low impedance. You have capacitance on top of it. And you could sort of say, as we'll argue later on, that this node is somewhat separated from the other nodes. Right, in fact, this thing that I just drew here is part of the R argument. Right, and answering that one question, the signal being so large there and so small here, it's kind of a separation of those nodes. And so that's why you could sort of say, okay, this node contributes the dominant pole, this one contributes the second pole. Okay, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Let's not worry about that now. Let's, let's push forward to talk about another thing that we need to be worried about with this particular design, and that is uh, output swing. Okay, so let's list a couple issues with this design here. Uh, so problems and issues. So first problem here is a limited limited output swing. So what do I mean by that? Uh, you know what output swing is. I want to know what the maximum output voltage is, what the minimum input voltage is for this thing. And so let's start calculating these things. This is something you better have some practice with because you know I'm going to ask you this on the midterm at some point. right? You, you see the example then this, because it's an important thing to be able to determine here. So let's get back to this, uh, uh, this circuit here. and let's, let's, let's try to determine what the maximum output can be here Again, what we're worried about is how high that output voltage can go before a particular transistor goes out of saturation. Right? We, this works well when everything's in saturation. If we're, just one transistor goes try out, everything goes bad. Okay? And so for this, you have to look at your bias point. And if you look at this, right, we've got VDD right here. So, so, so to get, what you want to do is go from VDD and get to the output. Right, so same procedure that we've looked at before. So if I'm at VDD, I've got a drop down here. Whoops, let me go for another color there. I've got a drop down here, and how much am I dropping there? I'm dropping a VGS of M7, but the VGS of M7 is a threshold voltage of 7 plus the overdrive voltage of 7. Okay, So I have to drop that much from here to here. Right. And this is diode connected, so that's going to be the voltage right here. 
already you can sort of see that's too much voltage, isn't it? Right? Because if I did this right, then I'd rather just have a VOV across here. That's all I really need to keep this transistor saturated. But I've got a lot more than that now. I've got VT plus VOV. That's a full 0.7 volts more than I need. And so that's a full 0.7 volts that I'm taking away from my total swing. That's bad. Okay. But, you know, I'm, I'll say things about this design, but this is the design we've got right now until we change it to something else, which we will. Okay. But let's just look at this design right now. So then I have to get from here to here and then finally I, I want to get to this node, right? I want to know what the voltage is at this node here because once I know the voltage of this node, then I know that I can drop a VOV here and that then is going to be my output voltage. Okay, So I, I go from VDD to that node, then I have to go from that node to that node. To do that, I have to drop a VT5 plus a VOV5. Okay, And then to go up this way, I'm going to go back up. That's going to be a VT6 plus a VOV6 going back up. Okay, and then finally I'm going to drop across here a VOV6. And that gets me to my output. Okay, so those are all the drops I'm looking. I'm going from VDD through these well-defined voltages back up and back down. Yes. Yeah, I can because these are the well-defined voltages because they're diode connected. You look for... Yeah. VOV, yeah. But see, VOV8, in order for this to be biased correctly, is going to have to take on a similar voltage to this side here. Right? At any rate, I can't drop less than VT7 VOV across this device, otherwise it's off. So I have to have that voltage across that. I have to have it across here to this node, and then this node coming back up tells me what this voltage is right here. I can't just go straight from M8 down. Right? This stuff dictates it because if this stuff doesn't dictate it, it's off. It'll be cut off. Yes? So, I mean, like, I mean, the best way to find, like, the, any swing is just to look at the worst case. Yeah. You got to look at the worst case for any swing because if you don't look at the worst case, a device is going to be off. Okay? So, you have to have all devices on and all devices saturated for the swing. Okay? So, with all this, now let's write this out. I did, I did that graphically here, but to write this out, that's, there's my VDD. I'm dropping from VDD a VT7 and a overdrive 7. I have those in absolute values because these are PMOS devices. Um, I'm dropping again another VT, this time VT5, and another VOV, this time VOV5. Okay, And I'm dropping, or no, I'm not dropping, but I'm going up now a uh, VT6 and a VOV of 6 and then finally to get to the output I'm dropping a VOV of 6 okay so obviously I can cancel out those VOV of 6's and this now becomes my maximum output voltage I cannot go higher than this otherwise something's going to be either off or it's going to be in trialed region Okay, so that's the equation. So you saw how I did that. Let's do it again, but this, this time let's come from the bottom because we're interested in the whole swing. Okay, so let's now get V output min. And this one is a lot easier now, right, because this is just a few overdrive voltages. Right, so I'm going to have an overdrive voltage for this ISS. I'll call that VOVSS. Okay, so that's from the tail current source. And then I'm going to have a plus VOV1, which is uh, a device 1, or I could say 2, either 1 or 2 there, uh, plus a VOV of 4. Let me say 2. Plus a VOV of, of 4. Okay? And that now is the minimum uh, voltage that I can put on the output without shutting off, without putting one of those devices in the trial region. Okay? And so now my swing voltage is merely what we've written before, 
what the V output max is minus the V output min. And if I ask you what the swing is for a given, for this uh, op amp here, this is what you would write. You'd, you'd get V out max, you get V out min, and you'd write this out here. And then you can write everything down into a single equation here, but I'm not going to do that here. So all of this stuff here says what? The swing is not enough. That's a problem, okay? And so we're going to need to solve that at some point. Uh, but before we solve that, let's just see how big of a problem this really is, right? There's, there's, there's an even bigger problem that we run into uh, when we have such a small swing on this. And that's that, how does this perform when actually in a feedback circuit like what we just looked at, okay? So. The, the second problem, this, it's difficult to tie the input to the output. Okay. Now, why do we care about tying the input to the output? Well, some of our most important op-amp circuits tie the input to the output. And so just a simple example of this is this. Recognize this? That's a very, very common op-amp circuit. This is a unity gain buffer. One of the most useful op-amp circuits ever. One of the simplest, but one of the most useful. Extremely useful for many applications. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you is that you got problems if you want to use that unity gain buffer here. So let's let's talk about what problems we have with this circuit here. Whoops, I don't want that circuit. Uh, Whoops, what did I just do? I just killed something and I have to put it back in. No, I did the right thing. Okay. Okay, so what I want is to steal something else, folks. So let me do that. I want this one. Whoops. All right. So this is now that same telescopic op amp but hooked up in unity gain. See, I've tied the input to the output. And so I've, I've hooked this up exactly the same way this is hooked up up here. Okay, and now what I want to do is determine the range of uh, voltages that I could apply, that I could have at the output while keeping all these devices saturated. Okay, and the biggest problem that I'm going to have is M2 and M4 here. Yes. Oh, because that's the way it is in this, that's the way it is here, right? I'm just exactly copying that circuit. Uh, okay, so our main problem here is going to be that we need to keep M2 and M4 in saturation, okay? And you may look at this and say, well, so what? What's the big deal, right? So just keep them in saturation. But let's, let's take a look at that a little more closely here. So let's take a look at M4 first. Let's get this on this side first. All right, so in order to keep M4 in saturation, we need to have V out larger than a certain value, right? If it gets too small, right, then M4 is going to lose its overdrive voltage across its VDS, and it's going to go out of saturation. So I can write an expression here that I'm going to need my output voltage V out to be greater than or equal to uh, basically 
going from this voltage here, right? This voltage at that node at the gate of M4 is going to be VB, right? VB is a DC voltage, right? That's just a bias voltage. So that's a constant DC voltage right there, okay? But then what's going to, it's, it's the same game as before, right? I'm going to go from this point here, I'm going to drop here a VT4 plus an overdrive of 4. And then I'm going to come back up here an overdrive of 4, okay? And that's going to be the minimum output voltage that I can have. So I'm going to take V out has to be greater than now VB minus... Uh, the VGS of 4, which is VT4 minus VOV of 4, and then plus a VOV of 4 coming back up. Obviously, these two cancel out, and therefore, V out in this case has to be greater than or equal to VB minus the VT of 4. Okay? So that that's the high output range of this, but now what's the minimum output range of this? The minimum range that I can take this output here, or sorry, the maximum range, that, that, that's the low voltage. I just did the low voltage. That's determined by M2. But what's the highest voltage we can get? Well, that's now the, sorry, the low is determined by M4. What's the highest voltage? That's determined by M2. Just look at the notes. I've, I've said it so many times that M4s and the M2s and mixed them up that it may be very confusing to you. But but now we're going to focus on M2 here. Okay, and M2 is going to determine us for us what the maximum V out can be. Okay, so let me go to another color here. So how about this color right there? Okay, so in this case, I'm going to need V out to be less than a certain value. Okay, and so what's that value going to be? So I, this is now M2 that I'm looking at here. Okay, so M2 is going to involve this voltage right there, which I'll call Vx. Okay, so in order for M2 to stay in saturation, if this is Vx here, then V out has to be less than or equal to uh, this Vx minus an overdrive of two, right? Because I have to drop across this. This has to have a cross at a VT2 plus an overdrive of two. And then it has to have across it an overdrive of two. So the way that I'm gonna to get to the output from this node X here is I'm gonna go from X across here, which is an overdrive of two, which I'm dropping across here. So VX minus an overdrive of two. And then I'm going to go up um, a VT2 plus VOV2, and that gets me right to the output, right? That's the output right here. Okay, so I'm going to add to that VT2 plus an overdrive of 2. And obviously, these overdrive of 2s cancel out. Okay, and so now all I need to know is what VX is equal to. And VX, right, is just be equal to this VB minus VT4 minus VOV4, okay? So I'm going to plug this in for VX now, and I'm going to get that V out has to be less than or equal to VB minus VT4 minus VOV4, and now what's remaining here plus VT2. That is about equal to, if I assume that VT2 is equal to VT4, or about equal to VT4, this is about equal to now VB minus VOV4, okay? So the constraints that I have on my outputs are that the output has to be greater than VB minus VT4, and it's got to be less than VB minus VOV4. Okay, and so let's see what those look like if I were to plot those. So, so what I want to do is plot the space of outputs that are now legal to keep this thing operating in saturation. And so let's plot this here. So I'm just going to draw a line for the voltage VB. Okay, and then I'm going to draw a line for, you know, the lowest voltage that I can get to. 
which could be here. So this is VB, if this is VB minus VT4, right, that's one of the lowest voltages that I can get to, right? It's got to be greater than that, this VB minus VT4. But then it also has to be less than this VB minus VOV4. And so this right here uh, is going to be equal to a VOV4 down. And maybe it's there. Well, let's make that realistic. So maybe that is realistic, what I drew. So right there, this now represents my allowable range of outputs. Okay? And, and remember, this is all 1 VT. That's all a VT4. So that's about 0.7 volts. Right? And this VOV4, how big is that? Yeah, that's going to be, might be 0 .1, 0 0.2, something like that, 0.3. That leaves about 0.4 volts of complete output swing for this thing. That's terrible, right? So that's why this is not a very good circuit to use for this. Okay, there's one more problem uh, that I guess I will mention here, but sort of leave for more discussion later on. Problem three is that the low frequency, and we sort of discussed this a little bit here, non-dominant pole. associated with the mirror node right where this this is the mirror node right here okay so it's associated with that mirror node this is going to hurt stability and feedback in feedback circuits, let's be complete. Okay, and so for a lot of this stuff, one solution to this problem here is to use a fully differential fully balanced op amp. Okay, that is a solution to a lot of the problems that I just talked about here for this telescopic or cascode type design. Uh, and we will talk about that a couple lectures from now. Uh, but another solution is to use this cascaded design. And I guess I will talk about that cascaded design in the next lecture. We're, we're actually a little over 430 right now, so let's stop here.